Bueno. A ver, buenos días, ¿me escucháis? ¿No? Ah. A ver, buenos días a todos. ¿Me escucháis, verdad? Bueno, buenos días a todos. Eh, soy Jorge Bernet, trabajo en el Instituto Nacional de Evaluación Educativa. Eh, ya me he dado a conocer en, en el foro de nuestro Moodle, así que, bueno, ahora me podéis poner cara. Bueno, eh, bienvenidos a, a este curso y, y a esta segunda parte de, de nuestra primera jornada eh, en este curso sobre la competencia lectora a través de la evaluación y después de, de esta potentísima eh, primera ponencia por parte de, del doctor Mata, vamos a adentrarnos ya en, en, en una temática relativa a la evaluación que tiene que ver directamente con los cometidos y con el trabajo del Instituto Nacional de Evaluación Educativa, que, que como bien indica nuestro nombre y apellido, es, es la evaluación. Entonces, para ello tenemos a, a dos ponentes internacionales, que son eh, Juliette Mendelovitz y Liz Twist, que son expertas de la, de la, evaluación, eh, de la evaluación de la lectura y de la lectura en, en general. Una de ellas ha estado involucrada durante muchísimos años en, en PISA, desde, desde antes de sus comienzos, Juliette Mendelovitz, y, y la otra de nuestras ponentes de esta segunda mitad de la mañana, Liz Twist, está muy implicada en la evaluación PILS, eh, que, que en España también se aplica y, y que evalúa competencia lectora en alumnos de cuarto de educación primaria. Entonces, le hemos dado este título genérico a, a, ambas, a ambas ponencias, la competencia lectora en la evaluación internacional. Vamos a comenzar con la, con la que corresponde a Julius Mendelovitz, la, la elaboración de evaluaciones a gran escala de la lectura impresa a la lectura digital. Bueno, Juliet es eh, directora de investigación y directora general del Consejo Australiano para la Investigación Educativa en el Reino Unido, ACER, en, en, en el Reino Unido, como digo, y está especializada en el desarrollo de, de, los, de los marcos y de las evaluaciones a gran escala nacionales e internacionales, específicamente en lectura. Juliet ha jugado un papel fundamental y, y ha desarrollado un gran liderazgo en el desarrollo de, de la competencia lectora del dominio lectura eh, en PISA, en, la, en el programa para la evaluación internacional de los, de los alumnos de la OCDE desde, desde el principio de los tiempos, desde que empezó PISA hasta, hasta la edición de 2012, eh, formó parte en el desarrollo de ese marco teórico y, y, y de la, del dominio de la competencia lectura. Su, re, su trabajo más reciente incluye la conceptualización y el desarrollo de, del indicador de competencia lectora que se ha desarrollado eh, eh, en el trabajo conjunto entre la UNESCO y ACER, que, eh, que tiene relación con, con, el, con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible de, de la UNESCO eh, de, para, para, para el año do, eh, 2030, específicamente el objetivo 4.1, que bien conoceréis, que, que dice así que es, eh, eh, se asegurará que todos los chicos y chicas, todos los alumnos y alumnos, eh, completarán una educación gratuita, equitativa y de calidad que conduzca a eh, resultados de aprendizaje relevantes y eficaces. En la actualidad, Julian es directora de, del proyecto eh, de ACER en el Reino Unido, eh, que trabaja con, con el Gobierno de Escocia y que está dirigido a la evaluación online de la evaluación de la competencia lectora y matemática en primaria y secundaria, de la que también hablará en su ponencia. Bueno, pues sin más retraso, te cedo el, la palabra, Julien. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. Buenos días. ¿Can you hear me? Yes. yes? Great. Well, you can hear the translator, which is even more important. <laughs> um, I'm very pleased to be here and I thank very much Carmen and uh, Jorge and their colleagues for inviting me to come and speak to you during this course. I think this is a wonderful idea, a wonderful concept and Liz and I have been talking about how this idea of having summer courses for teachers in evaluation, in assessment would be very helpful in our countries too. Better? Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you today about developing large-scale reading assessments 
uh, generally in international, an international assessment, PISA, which I worked on for about 15 years, and um, also some more recent developments in large-scale assessments that I hope will be of interest. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of a talk about why we, why we do assessments, what's the point of them. I'll give you some examples of national and international assessments. Then I'll talk in more detail about PISA, the development of its framework and the reading assessments, both print and digital. And finally, a few words about what's happening now in um, large-scale assessments, what are the new things that are happening. So first of all, why do we assess learning? Why do teachers assess learning? What is the point? I'm sure you have ideas about that in your minds. There are probably two main purposes for teachers to do assessments. First of all, to um, collect information for use in reporting to parents, to students themselves, to uh, the school at large and to local authorities. And the second reason, a very important one for classroom practice, is to gather information about what children have learned, what they are learning, where they are in their progression in reading or mathematics or whatever the subject is. Collecting information to help you as teachers to work out what the child needs next. So that is really for teachers I think, my organisation thinks, the really primary purpose of assessment in the classroom. So why do regions and countries mount assessments? Well, they also want to report, to collect reliable information for different levels, for the province or the nation, to see how the system is going, to perhaps give resources more fully to one place or another where they see a need, or to do some more professional development, or just to keep a, a track of how things are going at the, at the level. They also want to give back to teachers often, ideally, information about how the schools and how the children are going in the schools. And finally, another reason that sometimes schools or nations, or sorry, nations or smaller regions want to do assessments is to drive change, to help people to expand their notion of where education might go. There's a saying in English, uh, a pejorative saying about testing and assessment. Uh, testing, driving, learning is seen as a bad thing because teachers think assessments are a burden. Uh, and, and they make schools and teachers do things that they would, do not want to do and that are not good for children. But there's another side to that. If the assessments are good and useful, then they help. They're not a burden, they're a, a benefit. And sometimes innovations in education can come about because assessments show what is possible. So I think we would all aim to have assessments that do that kind of work. Well, what about um, participation of countries in international assessments. Why do countries participate? Sometimes countries have no national assessments, and I think that is the case in Spain. There's not one single national assessment that children, school children in primary and secondary do. So it's a way of a nation gathering information about across the nation so that they can get a sense of how children are going in a comparable way. There's also the obvious reason for doing an international assessment, which is to compare one's own country with other countries. So we know what we're doing, but what are they doing? Are they doing something better than us? What could we learn from them? So those kinds of motivations are what make international assessments attractive to countries. And again, there's an underlying reason that sometimes prompts things in education and certainly has driven some of the developments in PISA to introduce new ideas into the education communities around the world. Here's a way of doing assessments. Here's a way, a kind of learning that's important. Can we assess it? And some of the innovative 
areas of PISA have been designed with that idea in mind. So for instance, um, international civic education in this last round was a, a new area for PISA. Uh, in previous years, there's been problem solving. How can we assess problem solving? This is a very important cross-curricular competency that children need. So let's see whether we can assess it and that will bring it to people's minds. So that's another thing that drives international assessments and why countries are interested in them. So these are all the reasons that I've just set out as to why different groups do assessments, learning assessments. What sorts of connections are there between them? Well, that reporting purpose for different levels is common to all three, teachers, national groups and international groups. So when there's an assessment, there's always some kind of reporting and those are common reasons, although they're for different audiences. Better? Okay. Giving information back to schools and teachers or, uh, from assessments is another important common factor, at least at the classroom level and at the regional level. Is that okay? Can you still hear over there? Can you hear? Yeah. So there are some common purposes between classroom assessments and um, national assessments and international assessments. And then there are a couple that are probably more removed from the classroom, those ones about comparisons, making comparisons between different uh, regions or schools or with other countries is a, not su such a concern for classroom teachers and can seem sometimes a little oppressive. And then that last one that I mentioned, introducing new ideas, again, that may be a component of classroom assessments, but probably not the strongest component. As a teacher, you want to know where your children are, what they've learned. You wouldn't be using assessments to introduce new ideas because you have lots of other ways of doing that in your classroom practices. So um, some examples of national and international assessments, some of which you may know of and some not. At the national level, the first large-scale assessment was um, implemented in the late 60s, a long time ago, in the United States, a program called NAEP, Evaluación Nacional del Progreso Educativo. Uh, not Inglaterra, it's actually American. Um, so they started as a monitoring assessment where they would sample children from across the country to see how, how they were learning and how they were going. And that has been going continuously for, what is it, almost uh, 50 years, yes. Um, uh, another national assessment, very, very different, much smaller scale and much more recent, is uh, an evaluation of educational progress in Afghanistan, which my company, ACER, has been working on since 2012. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. They are both sample assessments, which means not all the children in the country are assessed, just a small group, enough to give a good representation of the country. And the last one on that side, the Scottish, standardized, Scottish National Standardised Assessment, which was only introduced last year. That's a population assessment. So all children at four levels in Scotland take an assessment once a year and that serves multiple purposes. Again, I will talk a little more about that later. On the international scene, there are a number of regional assessments, not full international, but um, countries within a region. So there's one that's been running for a long time in Africa for French-speaking countries, another one in Africa for English-speaking countries, there's one in Southeast Asia, and this one, the Laboratorio Latino America de Valuación de la Calidad de la Educación, YETE, Perhaps you have heard of that one. That's been going since 1994, so that's quite a long-standing um, assessment. And most of the countries in Latin America, Spanish-speaking countries, take part in that assessment once every three years, I think. And they use that for comparison, for giving feedback to the country. And then the one that you probably have all heard of, PISA, Program for International Student Assessment, which began in the year 2000 for the first um, collection of data and has been running every three years since. 
The latest one was this year, 2018. And the last one on this list is Pearls, which Liz will be talking to you about, which is for nine-year-olds. PISA is for 15-year-olds, Pearl is for nine-year-olds. PISA is, has core areas of reading, mathematics and science. Pearls is just about reading. So I'm going to be talking to you at, in more detail about PISA and more about the reading than the other parts of it, since this is a course about reading. And I'll talk particularly about the development of the framework and the assessment tasks, the items. So this is a little diagram showing the years in which PISA has run. It was first run in 2000 with 32 countries. Uh, and every three years since then, now in 2018, I think there are about 70 countries. So it's all the OECD countries. And obviously there are 35 OECD countries, I think, thereabouts. Obviously a lot of other countries have joined in who are not OECD countries. The assessment was originally designed for developed countries, so it had a particular focus. Many other countries have joined in who are developing countries with less developed systems of education, and the assessment has been modified somewhat to take account of that, that population too. Um, once every nine years, the three central areas, reading, mathematics and science, have a big focus, they're called the major domain focus. And in that, in that year, every ninth year, there is a revision of the framework, so the experts go back to the framework and look at it and see if it's still current and relevant, what should be added, what should be dropped. There are new items included. In the other years, that same subject is assessed, but only with a few of the items. So enough to give some information back to the countries, but not a major report. So for reading, it's had three goes. It was the first one, the first cab off the rank, as we'd say in English. <laughs> and then again in 2009, there was another big review of reading and a lot of new test development. And again in 2018, there's been a big revision. So you can see that um, the, the principal area of assessment changes um, every three years, but there's always a bit of a sampling done every, nine, uh, every three years. My company, ACER, Australian Council for Education Research, uh, ran PISA for the OECD for the first five cycles from 2000 to 2012, and that's when, where I know anything about PISA from. Since then, the last two cycles, um, a different consortium has been running PISA. So my talk is mostly about the first 12 years of development, or in fact, those first two big reading cycles. In the first year, I was a test developer. I wrote questions uh, in 2000. In 2009, I was in charge of the reading development for the international project. Um, and in 2012, it wasn't reading anymore, but I managed all the test development for PISA. So I had quite a lot of involvement for those first 12 years. So what is a reading framework? We began with a reading framework and developed test items at the same time. It was quite a quick turnaround. Um, a reading framework is uh, an explicit statement and discussion about what an in a framework intends to measure. So it's important to start off with some sort of theory about what you're trying to do. And its reasons are to help the test developers to create an assessment that is meaningful and useful, to give a common language for discussion about the subject, reading in this case, to make sure that there's continuity from one year to the next so that you're not assessing one thing in 2000, something different in 2009, which would make comparison difficult or impossible. So having the framework gives a kind of steady anchor. And and to communicate the purpose and the features of the assessment to the public, to, to teachers, to schools, to systems, to parents and to students. Um, so the, the framework allows us to talk about the assessment in a way that we hope makes sense.
the framework development begins with a definition of the subject. So what is reading? I don't think I had ever really tried to articulate what reading was until I started working on PISA. And the, the definition of reading has changed slightly since 2000, but it's not very different, so it's had continuity over time. And here it is, the PISA definition for 2018. Reading literacy is understanding, using, evaluating, reflecting on, and engaging with texts in order to achieve one's goals, to develop one's knowledge and potential, and to participate in society. As you all know, I'm sure the OECD is the Organisation for Economic um, Cooperation and Development, so it's got a kind of a, an economic mantra. So that participating in society is, a, is an important thing for the OECD and for nations too. So it's personal development, having a job, and contributing to society, they're all important. There was a lot of discussion, there is always a lot of discussion about the definition, hours and hours of debate that go into that and it's very carefully crafted and every part of it becomes part of the assessment. So if you look at these bits in different colours, the use to, to use, um, reflect on and um, have interest in the assessment is part of what PISA is about, and that's reflected in different parts of the framework construction. And the texts, the cognitive processes and the scenes, the um, contexts are all taken from the framework into actual assessment items. So for texts, we have the, the source of the text, the organisation and navigation of the text. This is particularly important for digital assessments. The format of the text, whether it's continuous, non-continuous or mixed, and the text type, narrative, discursive, ex expositive, or so, and so on. The processes, which appear in red in the definition, have been defined as locating information, understanding, and reflecting and evaluating. And the contexts, personal, public, educative, and professional. So all of those elements are instantiated, they're represented in every item. Sorry, not all of them are, but one from each of those categories is represented in each item to give good coverage of what reading is. <clears throat> By the way, I believe that this PowerPoint will be available for you online um, after the course. So. By all means, take notes, but you don't have to take notes, you'll, you'll get the information. <clears throat> so just thinking about the texts in particular, as you saw, there were three different text formats, continuous, discontinuous, and mixed. Are you familiar with these concepts? Yeah, some are. So continuous means the text that's in the paragraphs. Um, story, it could be a story or an article but it's continuous prose um, and sentences. Um, Non-continuous text is text in the format of tables or graphs or diagrams where there, is, there are words, otherwise it's not counted as reading, but there may also be images. So it can be a combination. And a mixed text is a text that has both continuous and non-continuous features. So it could be a newspaper article with a prose report and a table, or something of that kind. So every text in PISA fits into one of those three categories. And there's a prescribed balance of text. So uh, it used to be, I'm not sure what it is now, it used to be, I think, 60% continuous, 30% uh, non-continuous, and 10% mixed. It may have changed slightly. But there's a prescription and a target for the development. Then types of text, these are probably terms that you are quite familiar with. Descriptive, narrative, expository, argumentative, instructive, and transactional, which is probably a little less familiar. It is in English-speaking countries anyway. Transactional means things like letters or blogs where you're writing to get a response. And again, every text in PISA is classified according to one of those categories. I think sometimes um, in traditional language 
education systems, there is a lot of emphasis on narrative when reading is being taught and not much emphasis on anything else and certainly not on non-continuous texts. And one of the aims of PISA was to expand the notion of reading so that there was a more, a fuller account of what reading is to prepare young people for life in, in the world in which most adults, in fact, read more non-continuous text than continuous text. Here's an example of a text from Pisa, which you may know from outside Pisa. <laughs> uh, Macondo, it's from 100 Years of Solitude. Uh, and that was one of the texts that was used in the very first assessment of Pisa in 2000, this particular piece, and again in 2009, because some of the material is used again so that we can track trend over time. So if you look at this text, which text format do you think this one is? Remember the three were continuous, non-continuous and mixed. Continuous, yep, yeah. okay. And what about text type? Is it narrative, expository, descriptive? Narrativo, si, bueno, okay. Okay, here's another text. Here's the answer. <laughs> Here's another text. This one came from PISA 2000. And um, increasingly in PISA, uh, countries have been invited to contribute text material or stimulus for mathematics and science, and sometimes questions too. But we ask countries to send in to the centre things that they think 15-year-olds would be interested in, that they, they would find in their country was useful as a reading assessment. And this one was sent in from Chile. Um, and it was turned into, a, it, actually it wasn't sent in like this, I'll show you what it was like originally. This is, what it, this is how it appeared in, in PISA in 2009. So thinking again about the text formats, continuous, non-continuous and mixed, which one do you think this one is? Discontinuado, see, sí? okay. And what about the text type? Narrative, expository, Descriptive, transactional. <laughs> Hands up those who think it's narrative. Narrative? No? <laughs> okay. Um, instructional? Hmm? Descriptive? Yay. <laughs> I got it right. Yeah, it is descriptive. Yes, yeah, so it's just a. It's just a description of a system. There's no elaboration which would make it exposition. It's just description, yeah. So it's not always clear cut though. It's, it's, sometimes it's not really straightforward to decide what a text is. So something worth thinking about. Now turning to the cognitive processes. Every item in PISA has uh, an alignment with one of these three broad areas. And as you can see, they're divided into subcategories as well. So the first one is locating information, which means going into a text and finding something which is usually literally there. You can find the words exactly. Often associated with information texts or descriptive texts, not so often with narratives. The second category, the broad one, second broad category, understanding. Um, this is a very broad category, and in fact, about half of the items in PISA fit into this category. So it's finding um, links between parts of the text, so integrating different parts of the text, making inferences from what is literally stated, and um, sometimes when there's more than one text, making comparisons and contrasts across the text, or even within a text. So a lot of different um, mental processes are involved in that one. And the last category, which I think again was quite an, uh, an innovative category for some countries, education systems, evaluate and reflect. So evaluating can be about judging the quality and the credibility of a text. Reflecting 
on a text is can be again about thinking about the qualities of the text but also about thinking about your own experience and what you know about the world in relation to a text so it's moving outside the text itself to thinking about how it relates to your world so again for people who love reading and value reading that's a really important part of the process isn't it sort of thinking about what in the text relates to your life, how your life relates to the text. And so that was also included in PISA. Not a large proportion of the items, but some of the items um, address that cognitive process. So here's Metro Transit again, old friend. Here's one of the questions that was included in the PISA assessment in 2009. Um, you don't have to find anything here, I'm not asking you to do the question, but what, which of the cognitive processes do you think this one addresses? Is it locating information, is it understanding, or is it evaluating and reflecting? In your head? Okay, so that's how it was categorised. Again. These ones can be subject to a lot of debate, um, but uh, it's accessing and, and um, retrieving information from a very straightforward text. Here's another one from Macondo. At the end of the passage, why did the people of Macondo decide not to return to the cinema? Now, I'm not asking you to read the text, although some of you may know it already. Do you think that's a, a, a locating information question or an understanding question? or a reflecting and evaluating question? Is all the information there in the text or do you have to think about your own experience or your judgment? That's how we classified it. So drawing an inference from and within the text. And here's one more example again from a condo. Do you agree with the final judgment of the people of Macondo about the value of the cinema. Or explain your response by comparing your views with those of the people. So what do you think that one is? Which, which of the cognitive processes do you think that one addresses? Locating information, understanding or reflecting and evaluating? Hmm? Hmm? Third one, yes. Okay, so just to give you a bit of a feel for the kind of thinking that goes into creating these items, we needed to address all of those different areas of text and processes. So in the first year of PISA, year 2000, the focus was entirely on print reading. There was already thinking about um, digital reading and the definition in 2000 took into account that there might be digital reading assessed later on but we didn't try to do that in the first round. But by 2009, it seemed very important to have digital reading because it is such a large part of people's reading. Now, then, and even more so now and into the future, it's really taking over. So why assess digital reading? Isn't it just the same as print reading, only it's on a screen? Well, no, it isn't. It has very special features. And here are some of them. So. Of course, it's still reading text and children need to develop the basic skills of reading, decoding and um, making sense of language to read in the digital format as well as in the print format. But there are a lot of differences. So some of them are just tabulated here. So in the one hand, you have the page of a book, web page is different. You have a book, a website. You have um, bio bibliographies and references to find out more. But on a website, you can just click on and go to your references straight away if you know how to use the system. And one big difference between print and digital texts is that uh, when you read a book, say, you usually read linearly. You turn the page, you read the next page, and so on and so on. In a digital text, very often, you're going all over the place. You're sort of creating your own text, depending on how you navigate. There's one area that I didn't put up here for the comparison and contrast, and that is about the source of the text and the publication of the text. Generally speaking, in 
printed text, published text in the print world, there's an author, there's an agent, there's a publisher, there's a bookseller and so on. There are all these different people. The, the publication has to go through all of those filters before it gets to the reader. And so there's sort of a, a bit of a process of evaluation, censorship if you like, filtering that goes on. In the digital world, oftentimes people can put up anything they like. There's no filter between the author and the reader. And that creates its own set of challenges. And I think tomorrow, um, Laszlo, Lalo Salmaron is going to be talking a lot about that area of digital reading. I won't touch on that again, but it is an important area. So, in 2009, we introduced digital text as a, an option in PISA, and 19 countries took part out of the 60 or 70 that were able to do it. Spain was one of them. Um, UK was not one of them. Australia was one of them. So countries decided whether or not they wanted to do digital reading. By 2015, all countries were expected to do a digital reading component. And in 2018, I think there's only digital reading. So printers more or less disappeared. So this is what we said about uh, the importance of navigation in PISA in the report that came out of the 2009 study, that uh, navigation is a key component in digital reading. People who navigate well find the reading task much more straightforward and find information quickly. People who don't know how to navigate well struggle to make sense of the reading. So a lot of the focus on the assessment in PISA 2009 was on assessing whether children could navigate in the digital framework. Um, so we were thinking about two elements, processing text, which is the same sort of skills as in print reading, and navigation. And we designed items so that they assess different degrees of those things. So there were some items that had low text processing, just a few words maybe, and not very much navigation, maybe only one or two pages. Then there were texts that had a lot of words and not very much navigation. Texts that had a lot of navigation and not many words, like buying a ticket for a cinema, um, occasion, so there's not just the names of the films and the times and so on, but you had to go to a lot of pages to get that information. And then there were texts and uh, questions where there was a lot of text and a lot of navigation, they were the most challenging ones. So we kind of designed the items to they'd test all those different areas. I'm just going to show you one example of a digital reading text from 2009. By the way, all the texts that I'm showing you and all the items I'm showing you are in the public domain, so there's a whole lot of material that is held secure, so it can be validly assessed for trend, but these ones have all come out into the world. This was a, a unit about a, a girl, a 15-year-old girl, who wanted to be a volunteer, and she, ha was, she writes a blog. So the first part is about her blog, I, I would really like to contribute something to the world, so I'm thinking about what kind of um, volunteer organisation I should join, these are my interests, da da da. And then she, her friend tells her that she should go to this page called I Want to Help, which has a whole lot of different volunteer organisations and allows people to find out more about them and select one that they think is suitable. So there's a whole lot of web pages attached to this, to this facing page, different website. And then eventually the student is asked to choose a volunteer organisation on behalf of MICA and they send her an email to tell her why it's a good one for her. So that's the task is choosing for Micah, the girl, and telling her why she should go for it. So the last page is a, an email site where they key in their answer, and that is what's, what's assessed. But we also collected information about how they navigated. So the data collection included timestamps on every page that the student went to, so we could analyse afterwards, without contributing to the score, because it was a research exercise, um, analyse how efficiently they went from one place to another. And then we looked at the relationship between their scored answer, which was how they answered the question, which entailed going to all these different web pages, the relationship between that and which web pages they visited. And we found that there was a lot of diversity in their navigation skills. Some of the very best performers on the whole assessment uh, went straight through and found exactly what was needed. Some of the worst also went straight through and probably didn't find what they needed, but they were also very quick and only looked at two or three web pages. In the middle, 
children had all sorts of different pathways and there's ongoing research to look at the relationship between the pathways that people take and what sort of success they have in terms of finding a good answer to a question. So that was the kind of model that we used for digital reading in 2009 and that has continued. That kind of model is being used with some modifications still in PISA 2018 and I'm sure that there are more things happening that will ensue in, in um, later years. There's the question that I was just talking about. Okay, so what's happening in reading assessment lately in large scale assessments? So this is back to the page I showed you near the beginning of some different assessments. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them in very, in, uh, very briefly. The um, assessment of um, learning in Afghanistan since 2012. And this is a program, there are lots of, a lot of programs going on in Afghanistan, as you probably can imagine, to help in various ways with health, um, with the military, of course, with housing and with education. Many organisations are working in Afghanistan. And ACR was contracted by the Ministry of Education in Afghanistan to develop a learning assessment so they could monitor, monitor what was happening in different parts of Afghanistan. In fact, only 13 of the 30 provinces in Afghanistan were able to take part because of security issues, but that was still quite a, you know, a useful collection. And there was a collection of year six assessments in 2012 and an assessment of year three children in 2014. So this is part of the year three assessment, which was delivered on tablets, on um, iPads. Um, that was quite an adventure. So <laughs> um, the reason for doing that was because it was easier to capture the information digitally than in print. Carrying the papers around through the countryside was quite a challenge. And this was a challenge too, but this was what was decided on. And this is a little bit of the assessment of reading for uh, year three children who are seven or eight years old. So they have a storybook, a digital storybook, and they tab on these pages. As they click on each page, they get the continuation of the story. It's quite short, but it's got pages like a real storybook. And this little icon down here with the mouth on it, if they click on that, they hear the instructions. So they, sometimes they have to read the text, but sometimes they just have to listen and it's to see whether they understand the language as well. So here's a few pages of the story. They can click through the story, they can hear it read to them, or they can read it themselves if they're able to do that. And then here's a question. Again, the answers are voiced. So by clicking on the mouth button, they can hear the question, the multiple choice question, and then they click on the one they think is correct to enter their answer. And that's all captured on the tablet, taken back to um, Kabul and sent to ACR for analysis. So it's quite a, an interesting program that has got some legs. <laughs> this is a, a photo of the pilot of this um, year three reading assessment. So the invigilator went into the village. He had the children sitting around him. You can see there's a group of girls here sitting around having a look at how it works, having the instruction. And then here they are sitting and doing the assessment with their own tablets that were brought in. So that, was quite, that is quite an exciting part of uh, the work that ACR is doing now and we're hoping to develop that further over the next few years. A very different assessment is one that I'm working on myself in the UK for ACER and that's the national um, assessment of children in primary one, which is four and five-year-old children, primary four, which is nine-year-olds, primary seven, the last year of primary school, and then secondary three, which is 13, 14 year olds in third year of secondary school. So all children in government schools in Scotland, and that's most children, are doing this assessment. They do it in reading, mathematics and writing. And it was introduced last year and it has some interesting features. As I just said, it's all the children in those year groups that are doing it. The main purpose of this assessment is to give useful information to school and teachers about how their children are going. The teachers have to report nationally on attainment of their children, but most of the 
information that they use is their own classroom assessments, but they can use this assessment to help them to make the judgment. So it's not the only evaluation, it's a part of the evaluation. Um, two interesting technical features of this that we have helped them to develop are that it's online and adaptive. Do you know that expression, adaptive assessment? It means that depending on how well the child is answering the questions, they move to different questions in the assessment. So this is a diagram of how it works. So in our model, the first 10 items are the same for everybody. They're actually different sets, but they are about all about the same level. Then if they do well, they go from A to B. And then if they do well on B, they go from B to D. So 10 questions each time. So each child is getting about 30 questions. On, on the contrary, if they don't do very well in A, they go to an easier set of questions, which we expect will be more at their level. And then if they do well on these ones, they go to a harder set here or to an easier set here. So it means that <coughs> it's a different kind of experience for each child when you get in the assessment. And because it's digital, it can be done instantly. All the, all the questions are answered automatically and, sorry, scored automatically. So there's instant feedback within the system to send them on the appropriate path. The advantages of uh, uh, adapt, adaptive model are that, um, well, a possible advantage is that you can have fewer questions to get a precise measure of where the child's um, attainment is. However, if you've got a curriculum, a broad curriculum, and you want to actually sample from the curriculum, you need more than a minimum number of questions. To get an accurate notation, you could have 10 questions only. <coughs> But to get curriculum coverage, you need more than that. And 30 is about the number that we think is reasonable. But what it does do is can give a better description of what the child can do because we can use the items that the child has seen to say what they are doing well and what they're not doing so well. And if all the items are too hard for a child, all you can say is they can't do this, they can't do that, they can't do the other. Not very helpful or encouraging. And if the child is very clever, and they can do everything, then you can't say, well, what should they be doing next if, all, if they can answer everything? So we, our aim is to have an assessment that pitches right for each child according to their attainment so far. And another important ingredient is that it's a better experience for the child. So even the brightest kids, we hope, will be seeing things that challenge them, and even the children who are struggling will be seeing questions that they can do. So this is another development that we are excited about and hoping to um, do more work with as we go on. So that's all I wanted to say for now. Thank you very much for your attention. Bueno, pues antes de pasar a la, a la presentación de Liz Twist, si queréis plantear preguntas a Juliet sobre su presentación, sobre PISA, sobre el trabajo que desempeña en este momento, eh, ahora sería la oportunidad. Hello. Uh, so, um, do I ask in Spanish or in English? Well, uh, uh, mm, uh, what I think is that uh, you train the children at schools in order to uh, to do those exams. I mean, um, the, those international exams they have got a specific structure, specific structure, and uh, mm, I understand that the children at school are trained or. Um, in order to, to face uh, those exams in, the, in, a, in a proper way. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean that they use the computers at school in order to get the digital competence that mm -hmm. they need uh, uh, to do those exams. I understand that. Mm -hmm. And to succeed. 
And um, on the other hand, I understand that especially the reading text, they need to know strategies in order to, uh, uh, to find uh, the answers uh, more uh, easily, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, in the frame of time, because there is a frame of time, maybe in an hour they need to, to do three or four uh, uh, readings, you know, mm -hmm. I'm uh, talking about especially the IELTS, IELTS exam, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, I took it in Scotland last mm -hmm. uh, year, you know, and uh, in, in other, uh, I had to read, I, I think it, it was um, three or four reading texts in, in an hour and to find the, the answers very, very, very quickly, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I think uh, those international <coughs> exams are, are okay if the teachers are aware that they have to teach in a certain way mm. uh, for the children when they have to take them they succeed, you know, and they don't feel anxious yes. in some way. Mm -hmm. And on the other uh, hand, I just wanted to ask if you give the same uh, meaning to assessment and evaluation. I'm not uh, very sure about that. I, I don't know if the assessment is the process that you evaluate and evaluation is the final result. Maybe okay. it's not exactly like that, but I would like you to uh, to explain a little mm. bit uh, how, do you, uh, how you differentiate mm. those two terms, e evaluation and <coughs> assessment. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, so the first question was about preparation for exams or assessments. I think there's a clear distinction between something like IELTS, which you are doing for your own career, personal, uh, and, and your result matters very much to you and between assessments like PISA or PEARLS where the individual result is not important. It's not, it's not high stakes for the, for the individual. PISA and PEARLS, I'm sure, are designed so that children have a chance to practice the basic item formats and techniques of using the technology, whether it's digital or print, but we do not want people to rehearse or to practice doing the assessment. The assessments are supposed to be designed so that if somebody has the basic equipment of knowing how to click on a button or turn a page, they can do it without practice. And we really want to find out whether children are doing the kinds of things that are assessed in those kinds of assessments in their classroom across the nation, not whether the individual can answer this particular question. So I think there's a, quite a difference and the aim is not for children to rehearse or for countries to, to coach their children for these assessments at all. Um, does that answer your question? I mean, I know that sometimes that happens, even though that's not the aim, but it certainly is not the aim. And there are little practice assessments within the, the, the assessment session to give people confidence about how to answer the questions. The other question about assessment and evaluation, I have, I have to confess I have never understood the distinction. I think people use those terms differently, interchangeably. Some people are very kind of fierce about their definition and some people, for instance, in Scotland, we are never allowed to use the word test. It's assessment. Um, fine, but I don't think it's universally um, a definition between assessment, evaluation and test that one can apply. Do you, do you have a um, different view? Yeah. yeah? Um, Um, we keep assessment to tests or exams and evaluation to measure the impact of something that's happened. So the outcomes of assessment would, t would contribute to part of an evaluation rather than be the evaluation of itself. So we have a whole section of people who do it, work on evaluation. So we wouldn't use the terms interchangeably at all. There you see. <laughs> okay. um, any, other, any other questions for now? If not, I will just pass them back to you. Oh, you're going to do it? Yeah, 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 sure. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Juliet. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Uh, 
to have you present in, in our program and thank you for your valuable insight and, and for making it so easy for, for us. All right. Bueno, a continuación, eh, bueno, un aplauso por favor. Muchas gracias. Bueno, pues a continuación eh, seguiremos con la presentación de, de Liz Twist. Os voy a, os voy a dar un, unos detalles sobre, sobre su biografía y su, su trayectoria. Entonces, bueno, ella, ella eh, su formación inicial es como psicóloga eh, y también como, como maestra de educación primaria, eh, a lo que ha dedicado parte de su carrera. También ha trabajado como vicedirectora en, en centros de, de educación primaria. Y desde el año 1997 ha trabajado para la Fundación Nacional de Investigación Educativa de Inglaterra, eh, donde, donde ha coordinado eh, las evaluaciones nacionales de lectura y escritura, que cada año eh, llevan a cabo alumnos de, de 11 años de edad. Eh, desde el año 2000 trabaja para, para la evaluación PIRLS, uh, Progress International Reading Literacy Study, la, la evaluación de, progre de progreso internacional en, en competencia lectora, cuyo último informe de 2016, internacional y, y nacional, eh, se publicaron el, el pasado diciembre. Y, uh, y es parte de, del equipo de desarrollo. Hay, hay un equipo de, de expertos, es un, es un equipo muy reducido, eh, que, que, que trabaja en la selección de, de textos, de, de, de las preguntas y, y todo el proceso. Entonces, eh, Liz trabaja directamente con este equipo y en la actualidad ella es la jefa de eh, evaluación, eh, de desarrollo y de investigación de la, de la, asociación, de la Fundación Nacional para, Educa para Investigación Educativa Inglesa. Bueno, sin, sin más retraso, eh, uh, I'll give you the floor list so that you can present about la lectura en los centros de educación primaria y la evaluación PIRLS. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. My focus will be on pearls, um, and there are some differences, I think, between pearls and PISA that it will be useful um, to bring out as well. And I'm sure, well, I hope you've heard of pearls, but just a little bit of information about what pearls, the Pearls Survey is. It stands for Progress in International Reading Literacy Study. That's how we got the name. Although when it started in about 1998, 99, we would see it written down with the letters P, E, A, R, L, S, which is the little, um, what's used in jewelry, the little pearl, because people hadn't seen uh, where the name came from. So, it's, one, it's the baby of the international surveys. PISA is um, probably the biggest one. TIMS, Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study, is, I think, the oldest. PEARLS is the youngest, but it's, it's a beautiful survey, perfectly formed. Um, and it takes place every five years, and it, it has this extra year. TIMS is every four years. PISA every three, as Juliet said, although reading every third cycle. Pearls has this extra year because in reading development, you have to work on the texts as well. And then once you have your texts, you can then develop your questions, your items. So Tim's every four years, maths and science reading every five years. And it assesses just nine and 10 year olds. And I'll talk about why it's that age group a little bit later. So the most recent uh, results were published last December. Um, 50 countries took part. Um, so it's creeping up, slowly creeping up the numbers. And 11 benchmarking countries or jurisdictions. And they participate separately. They're not, they're, the, their results are published but they're published slightly separately from the main participating countries. And, and in Spain, there were 629 schools, um, 14,500 students, and give or take, 
670 something teachers as well. So a big sample, in fact, of students in, in Spain took part last year. Um, no, 2016 was actually when they did the survey, and then 2017 was when it was published. There's, there's a gap between the assessment being completed by the children and the results being published, because you can imagine the amount of work that has to be done in, in the meanwhile. And the headline findings are always a list, the order of countries from the highest achieving. And we try to find different ways of presenting the results so that's not just that's not the only thing or the main thing that gets focused on and this is quite hard because the the press the media always like to say as if it's a, a league table of football performance who is best um, but there's a lot more for all the surveys beneath that list of the highest achieving country and the next highest you there's much much more information um, but in reading the outcomes, one of the key outcomes is the reading proficiency, and that is on a scale, a numerical scale, that can be compared from one survey to the next one in five years' time. So individual countries are able to see the trend, the direction, whether their performance is improving, whether 2016 performance was better than 2011, for example, and better than... 2006. So an individual country may find that it was in the seventh position in one survey and the tenth in, an, in the next survey because more or different countries have taken part, but their actual performance may still be improving. So that's why league tables are, are limited in what they, what they say. Um, and we divide uh, pearls into two purposes a lit and why you might read literary reading, which is narrative, which uh, links up with PISA, and informational reading. And we also have four different purposes. So there are some similarities with, with the structure of PISA, but also some differences as well. And in many ways, to, to reflect better that we're talking about primary age students who have, a, on the whole, a slightly different balance of the material that they read compared to 15-year-olds. And just to go to, to deal with the digital issue, Pearls uh, was designed to be a paper-based assessment. It was booklets that were given out to students in their classroom, and they completed it in pen or pencil. Um, over time, as children's digital literacy and as, as their access to online reading has, has changed, so Pearls, as, as with PISA, has also changed. And in the next survey in 2021, so every five years from 2016, then the, the direction very much will be that countries will complete the main assessments I'm not talking now about on-screen, digital literacy, on-screen assessment. The main assessment that currently is on paper will be on-screen. It won't be assessing digital skills, that's separate, but it will be assessing reading comprehension, but it will be on-screen. It will be digital delivery. And when you look at some of the uh, passages and the items, you can imagine how that will be. And there is also what we call e-pearls, which is a separate assessment of people's digital competence. And that is how effectively they read websites and they can navigate and some of the skills that Juliet spoke about. And that was trialed in 2011. There are, if you go, if you just Google Pearls 2016, trialed in 2016, you'll be able to see there are uh, two released uh, blocks of e-pearls, one called about the planet Mars and one about the first female uh, medical doctor, Elizabeth Blackwell. And they show how we conceive of e-pearls being children's ability to navigate websites through an avatar, a little symbol. Um, I'm not particularly going to talk about digital pearls today, but it, it is the direction, as with PISA, the direction of travel is to have students completing pearls through 
um, a tablet or a PC. So why this age group, nine to 10 year olds? Well, the, the reason for focusing on, on this is that in most countries, and of course we always end up having to talk about the average, what is overall, in most countries by this age, it's about their fourth year of schooling. Children have, for the most part, learned to read. They've learned to decode. Obviously, you continue practicing and becoming more competent as you get older. But by about the age of nine, most, not, not all, but most children have got to grips with decoding. They've learned to read age-appropriate texts. We could still find things that they wouldn't be able to read, but things that you expect to read. Most children can decode it and have some understanding. And they're now beginning to use that understanding to read, use reading to help them learn across the curriculum so they can look at information books in geography. They can be set up to do some science and the teacher can focus on the science rather than worrying about their ability to read. So that's why, so this is the point at which most, and it isn't all, but most children have learned to read and are now using that skill to access the wider curriculum. Um, I should mention um, what we used to call pre-pearls and we now call pearls literacy. So what happened in the early years of pearls, 2001, 2006, was that it was very clear that some countries were very keen to participate but the students really at the age of nine were not reading well, met most of them. South Africa was a, a, a very good example. Um, Morocco was another one. And so the information they were able to get from Pearls was very limited because it wasn't very precise. It didn't tell you very much because so many of those children really couldn't answer any of the questions or enough of the questions to get a, a reasonable measure, which is what Juliet was saying, the reason why adaptive testing potentially has a lot of value. So we introduced an assessment that was essentially easier than PEARLS. And in most developed countries, certainly in Spain, in the UK, it's a bit too easy for nine-year-olds. They tend to get almost all of it right, so it doesn't tell you enough about their reading skills. But in some countries, it's got the right level. Um, so we have Pearl's literacy, and I think it's about two years below the main Pearl, so it probably works for about seven-year-olds um, in Spain, in England. But it, it, is, it gives some countries a better measure of the typical performance of their... Uh, the children who are doing pearls, the 9, 10, and in fact, in South Africa, they're 11 and 12-year-olds. So there is pearls, and then there's this confusing one called pearls literacy. Um, as uh, Judith mentioned, the, how what each of the surveys describes what it is that they're assessing is really important. It's a framework for pearls, which I've got in my bag, but it's published again, and we're reviewing it still for the 2021 survey at the moment. But it defines um, what we think about, what we think reading is for this age group. And so this is the definition we have for pearls, and at the moment, I think we're not likely to change it, particularly for 2021, but it, 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 these things are always up for, for discussion. So it's very similar to PISA. I point out, I guess, um, this one, it's, it's understanding and using reading and why reading is important. The one big difference, which I will talk about a little bit later on, is it's the only one that mentions that reading also is for enjoyment. And I think this is, this is central. This is really what we hope that children will develop the skills, but will also see that reading is, is not only as part of their ability to earn a living, to develop and to grow, but also because they choose to do it. 
and that's really critical. And in primary schools, when much of when they're learning to read, we need them practicing reading. Not, not someone sitting beside them reading with them, but children practicing reading and reading at home. Then we want them to be motivated and to enjoy reading because those are the children who will become the fluent readers when they're motivated to read. So that's how we perceive Pearl. So yes, reading is of value to the individual. It enables them to participate in society, but it also is for their own enjoyment as well. So these are the, the um, three things I want to talk about today, how we go about assessing reading in pearls, and then just some of the information that we got from the 2016 survey, which was published in, uh, in December 2017 about the, the um, performance of, the, of, uh, of Spain in that survey. And then also one of my <laughs> interests about what, from the surveys, what we know about children, what they think about reading, how, um, how they feel about it. So I should explain how we know that. One of the things is we have questionnaires. We have attainment data. We have the assessments themselves. But then we have a series of questionnaires that are done. So the students take the assessment, and then there are some questions, all sorts of things, what we call background information, um, which includes, obviously, their age. But it also includes their gender. It includes uh, whether they enjoy reading. And there's a series of questions about that. Uh, we ask them, um, in Pearls, we ask them how many books they have in their home, um, because that's what we call a, a good proxy, a stand-up, standby measure for their socioeconomic status, the advantage or disadvantage, the circumstances of their family. So there's, a, there's some further information we get, which gives us background. So these are just two examples of little bits, they're extracts from pearls. Again, these are published, so they're not in the current, uh, they won't be in 2021 pearls, they're, they're uh, open for people to, to, to use and to, to get an idea of what the survey looks like. And pearls, what, what the students, the students don't see it quite in this form. They see, they get a booklet on paper or they get, they see on screen, but they see the text first and then they read the text and then they see the questions. They don't get a page with a question, a page and a question. They get that in Pearl's Literacy. Pearl's Literacy, one of the differences, they get a page and a question, a page and one or two questions. So in this case, this, the little bit about the insects in the leaf, in the leaf litter is information about insects and then they read three or four pages of information look at the diagrams and then they answer the questions and so this is one of the information passages there are four information passages and there are four literary or narrative passages and the one on the right the top bit is an extract from the fantasy story uh, about um, a girl who falls asleep and, well, the end is, whether, is it a dream or is it not? Never quite decided, but thinks a crocodile is trying to break into her, her bedroom, as you do. Um, and they read the story and then they have a series of questions about that. And the students take two passages. So they might take an information passage and a literary passage, two information passages or two literary passages. Uh, it's randomized across a classroom. So students sitting at a table will be doing a different assessment to their neighbor. Um, and each assessment, each block, so the in inset block would take around about 40 minutes. So someone comes into the school, sits with this class of nine or 10 year olds, distributes the booklets, and they get 40 minutes to do one of the assessments. And there's about 13 questions, 17 marks, more or less. And then they have a little break because they're only nine, 10 year olds. They need to let up a bit of energy. And then they come back and do the second assessment, which is, is, is different. 
on a different subject. And then they have another little break, often lunch, and then they do their questionnaire. So we get information from them on, on the day that they've done their, their assessment as well. So just to give an indication of the, the types of assessment, we've got uh, types of question. So the, um, the one on the left at the insects, what's the main purpose of the article? So this is tr trying to, to look at one of our main purposes, interpret and integrate, um, very typical for information. And the one on the right, um, it's asking ab about the character of Anna, the little girl, and you're describing what she's like and giving examples of what she did that showed it. That's very typical um, of the sorts of questions we have, some of the harder questions that we have in pearls. And I'll look in more detail a little bit um, later on. So about half the questions are multiple choice. So four options. Um, and students choose one of them, so there's no need at that point for them to write. The other half are some form of constructed response. So these could be quite short, just asking for one word or a phrase, or they could be, as the one you just saw, was it has five lines. It's asking for two things, and it has five lines. Um, so that is requiring students to give a written answer. And of course, you're then in this territory of we're assessing reading, but we're asking them to respond in writing. So that, we always have to bear that in mind. It's a reading assessment, but the response for some of these items is in writing. And, and when, when it's scored, it's important that we understand that we're not scoring how accurate, how grammatically correct the answer is. It's, we, we give credit for their attempt to express themselves and we're looking to see what it is they're trying to say because it's not an assessment of writing, but we are, students are responding in writing. So one, two or three mark uh, answers, including, as I say, over several lines, but we're not looking for nicely constructed paragraphs with capital letters and full stops and punctuation. That's not the point. It's, it's the words that they use. It's what they're trying to say that we're going to score. So about 40 minutes for each of the blocks and then around about 30 minutes for the, for the questions. Now this is, shows you how the overall framework uh, for, for pearls. So there are, the, at the top we've got pearls, the main survey, just the, the first of those three labels. Then we've got pearls literacy, which is the material that's a little bit easier to enable us to get this good measure of, of uh, some countries where it's reading education is still developing. And then we've got e-pearls, so there are some differences. So both pearls and pearls literacy have about half the material on literary text, which in pearls is essentially story. We don't have any poetry because it's translated into 40 languages, and you really can't do justice to poetry if you translate it into 40 languages and then ask questions, so there's no poetry. So predominantly narrative in the literary um, purpose and acquire and use information. So about half and half, and that's for pearls and for pearls literacy. For e-pearls, which is our digital assessment, it's all information. So we're assuming, I know people read on Kindles and so on, but that's still a continuous text. It's just replacing a paper page with an electronic page but it's not digital reading as we see it. It's just, it's just translating one to the other. Digital reading involves much more um, than that. So for ePearls, we only have information text. And I say the two that were available to, to look at are one about the planet Mars and one about um, Elizabeth Blackwell. And then we've got the reading processes. 
So first one, which has about half the Pearl's literacy items, are retrieving information that is explicitly stated in the text. So you're looking at your, you're going to the right place in the text and you're extracting a particular word, phrase, or bit of information. And that's about half of the easier part of pearls, and 20% roughly. This is overall, any one particular block may be slightly different, but it's about 20% of e-pearls and, and pearls, the main pearls. Um, the second one, making straightforward inferences. So this is what competent readers are doing all the time without even being aware of it. They're making associations in, as, as they're reading, they're linking bits of information together that help build up their picture of what it is that they're reading. So that's about a third um, of pearls and e-pearls and about a quarter of pearls literacy overall. And then the, the big difference is that the other two, um, interpret and integrate, and the evaluation and critique elements, which are much more to do with the whole text, the whole block of information or the narrative that they've read, um, there's rather less in Pearl's literacy. It's, it's not, although there is a hierarchy of skills, I'm very wary of saying these get harder because it does depend on the text that, that you're reading. So, <clears throat> and I use it as an example. If someone gave me an advanced chemistry textbook and asked me to extract a bit of information, I probably couldn't do it because I'm not a chemist. I might be able to read the words, technically read them, decode them, but I wouldn't understand them. And I probably quite, I wouldn't be able to answer a question. But to a chemist, it would be probably straightforward. They would retrieve the information. So it does depend on what you're, what you're reading. But that's the overall uh, shape of pearls. So we expect the children to be demonstrating quite different skills, depending on what they're reading. But each student will demonstrate different, different skills as they go through. Um, and I should say that, that we ask participating countries to submit texts for pearls. Um, so we have um, a lot. It's quite an iterative process. We have a lot of reviewing of the texts. Um, and at the, at the moment, I think we've got texts, really, that are in pearls or about to be used from all over the world, um, very different. They get reviewed and developed. Um, they're translated into, into English, but into American English. And then um, that the review takes place in English. And then for use, they get translated into uh, 40 different languages. Um, so, as just to say, the types of text we have, um, as I said, in literary ones, we've got fantasy texts, myths and fables, contemporary narrative. Uh, we've been trying to look for a play script, not found one that we like at the moment. Um, in information texts, all sorts of different information texts. I think we haven't got one as sparse, anything as sparse as the metro map that was shown in for Pisa. I think because we probably don't, that's not the sort of text that you would expect a nine, ten-year-old really to be reading and coming across in school. We've used maps, um, but they're, they're set in a context. We've had a map, um, I think, in the very first one, Pearls 2001, we had a map. Um, that was a family wanted to go on a cycle ride and they had to hire cycles. And then there was something about that. We've had a map about going walking. So they're put in a more familiar context for nine and ten year olds because that's the context in which they're likely to have come across those, those sorts of texts. I just want to show now an example of what we call the standards in pearls, the benchmark. So the pearls 
the surveys don't have passing and failing. A student can't fail pearls. It, that, that notion doesn't exist. Um, and we're not trying to assess an individual student. It's not designed to give a score for a student. It's designed to give an overall measure of a country's competence rather than an individual student. But the only way to get that is to assess individuals. But they, they do one of 14 different booklets. So we want to know the competence of all these students and put that together. But what we can do is look at this overall scale that we have of, a re of reading competence and say there are certain, at certain points on the scale, this is the sort of thing we can say about what students can do at that sort of point on the scale. So what's called the intermediate benchmark, which is at, at a point of four, seven, five. I should say that um, for those of you who aren't aware, per, uh, uh, Spain's national sc scale score, the achievement score, was 528 in 2016. On average, so the average overall score with all the analyses was 528, I think. So this is rather below what is typical. So this is what students are scale, looking at 475 on the scale. This is what we expect are the skills being demonstrated. And you can see. Um, there are some limits beginning to, beginning to recognize language choices. So thinking about why a writer did one thing, only the start of that sort of skill, which you can imagine, it's, it's a higher order skill. It is more challenging. Um, and in uh, 2016, about 80% of students were achieving this, could, could do this, achieving at this benchmark. But to give you an idea of the range that, that we get, and in fact, I think it does indicate why we needed pearls literacy, the easier pearls. So in South Africa, there were just 8% of students who reached this benchmark. So if you imagine you're teaching uh, students of this age and just 8% had reached this benchmark. Um, compared to 94% in the Russian Federation. So that's the enormous breadth that you get when we talk about primary reading. Towards the end of primary school, what students can do. And 8% in South Africa, 94% in the Russian Federation. And of course, a lot around um, the 80% mark, which is most students can do this. And this is not the lowest. There is, I should say there's a low benchmark, lower than this one. Um, which, and the students who, who are not reaching that benchmark, those are the students who are really going to be struggling, who are, have not really, at that point, really learnt to read independently. Um, and it was... Uh, international average, about 4% of students didn't reach that. In Spain, about 3%. But those are your struggling readers. Um, and I haven't got here the number for South Africa, but it, uh, or some other developed countries. It is worryingly uh, high, the number of children who have not learned to read at the age of 9, 10. Um, so this item is pretty typical of the sort of item that children can do at this. Um, so in Spain, 82% of children could do uh, this sort of item. And the reason for having this format, this is quite an interesting one. So I think tomorrow you're looking at Macy and the Red Hen. It's one of the texts with some items that we used. But this is the sort of question, the question uh, in, in English, how does the author show you what the red hen is like? The nine, ten-year-olds struggle to explain this in their own words. It's quite hard. How does the author 
show you. Quite difficult to begin to construct an answer, and we don't want to, to stop those who know it in the head but can't write it down, can't get the words together. So multiple choice means that they're provided, they, they have to recognize that, and it makes it much more accessible. It is easier for them to do it now because we've given them four possibilities and they're recognizing it. So the type of question that they couldn't give an answer to in their own words, they can indicate that they understand it now because they're recognizing the answer. And that's one of the... While people sometimes moan about multiple choice because children can't express themselves, what it also does is give them a step up to that type of question that they very few would be able to articulate the answer. And, obviously, it would have to be scored accurately as well. So in this case, giving them a choice and enabling them to recognize something they couldn't express themselves is particularly useful. So that is, is quite a typical intermediate um, type of item. So um, internationally, 79% of students we thought could do this. Russian Federation, 96%. Uh, Morocco was the lowest, 34%. Mm -hmm. So the next benchmark is five, at scale point 550, so quite a bit higher. So this is a more challenging, uh, more accomplished um, set of skills that students have at this age. So when I said that they previously, we had that they were beginning to recognize the author's language choices. Here, we've got recognized the use of some language features, metaphor, tone, and imagery. So figurative language is now becoming something that they can begin to recognize. Um, so in this case, 39% of uh, Spanish students reach this benchmark. Um, in South Africa, it was 2%. Uh, Egypt, 3%. Morocco, 3 These are the countries that are struggling with the Pearl Standard. International average is 47%. Uh, Russian Federation, 70 Singapore, 66 Hong Kong, 65 So some countries really have most of their students competent at this level. Um, many are very similar to Spain, around about the middle, and some are really struggling. Very few students are working at this level. And then there is an advanced benchmark, which are your really very, very accomplished uh, readers, sort of the top 5 to 10%. Um, so typical of the high um, benchmark. So this is one where actually what we're looking for them to do is just find some information. So in and of itself, just finding information, not commenting on what the author intends to do, not evaluating it, not telling about the character, but actually just finding information. Um, the cues that the children have are, we say, um, they see the little uh, oval with the pencil in, and that's telling them how many points there are for this item. So it's reminding, and it's got number one and number two. So it's saying two things. This is the, the sort of clues that, that we want the students to be aware of. Two things to find. And we've put in bold um, what are two things Macy does that do not work. So we use bold, bold in the text and the numbers to, to help the students be aware of the sort of thing that we're asking them to do, these particular things. And this is where I, I wonder if some countries where children are just not familiar with written tests are disadvantaged. They have practice material, but it's nevertheless, in some countries, this is much more familiar than in others, and those clues about what we're looking for. So, although it's straightforward um, retrieving information, it's not the easiest 
um, because they have to work out where they'll find that information. And there's two things they're looking for, and it's uh, things that don't work. So. so those are, that's a sort of a quick run around the sort of assessments that there are in PEARLS. There's a lot more information that's published. Um, as with PISA, a lot of the information is made p freely available. If you just go to the PEARLS 2016 website, you can download a lot, a lot of it. Um, but what PEARLS also has, as well as the student achievement, it has the student questionnaire, which I mentioned earlier. It also has questionnaires completed by teachers and by school principals and by parents or carers as well. So there is a real wealth of information about the context in which children le have learnt to read as their parents remember, and the home environment, which of course in reading is so critically important as they're learning. The class teachers uh, can talk about the strategies that they're using to teach reading, and the school principals can talk about the school context and the resources and so on. So there's a lot of useful information. But one of the things I just, before we leave reading achievement and we move to engagement, is this. This is, this is the bit about um, the teaching strategies that Spanish teachers, those 670 teachers that I said completed the questionnaire for Pearls 2016. This is what they said um, they did. So this is the proportion of students whose teachers said that they do these things at least weekly. So the first set of data is the proportion of Spanish students whose teachers said this, and then the right hand is the international average proportion of students internationally whose teachers said they did this. And you can see that there is a very steady, tip, very typical relationship between the Spanish data and the international data. The last one is slightly, uh, according to this sample, less common in Spain. This is the author's perspective or intention. But everything else is very close to the international average. So that's just a sample of the sort of information that's from the, what we call the teacher questionnaire. And then, as I say, similar information from the, the principal's questionnaire as well. And if you're interested in early reading, so early years, beginning reading, then the home questionnaire is quite interesting. But this is what parents think they did. Um, so this is four years on. So the reliability, I think, is, is, is less sure. So I want to just to move now to the other... Uh, focus, which is on uh, students' engagement. So reading is just so um, central to, to students' success in life. And it starts, obviously starts in the home before they ever get to school. Children's love of books. There, there was a very old study in the, in the UK published many years ago, and it's never, it never gets referred to now, but it, it, was, but it, it found that the best predictor of later reading achievement at that time, since that it might be different now, but at that time, was whether a three-year-old could tell you what their favorite book was. And if a three-year-old, didn't read it, not to read it, but they could tell you the title of their favorite book. Because if you think about it, if they can t name a favorite book at three, they've been exposed to lots of re reading at home or at nursery. And it was a really good predictor of later achievement, which I think just, just, is just such an interesting statistic. This is one of the things that has worried us for many years in, in England especially. So we, we have, it's, it's this engagement, this wish to read. So we have this great group here with the halo. These are the children who can read and who love reading. And we've all got those in the classroom, and they're great because they're the ones that are a bit like sponges. Off of the books, they'll sit in the library, they'll read. They love reading. Okay. They quite possibly 
have got books at home. They quite possibly heard nursery rhymes when they were one. You know, they've had... For this has, teaching, reading has been fine. They've learned to read and they love it. You know, if we had a class of those, life would be easy, although other issues, no doubt. But. Then we've got the children who, they love reading, but they find reading hard. And I've written can't read, it, not necessarily can't read, but they don't find it the easiest of things. And they're quite possibly the children that will get extra help, but they haven't yet got that fluency of reading that will enable them to build on their enthusiasm for it. We've then got a group that certainly we worry about, who they've learned to read in the sense they've learned to decode, they've learned some of the strategies, but they just don't do it because they don't like it. They've got other things they do, so they are not practicing in their own time. They're not reading when they're not being told to read. They're reluctant to read. And the critical thing is they are not practicing reading. And then we've got those children who have not yet learned to read and who really have built up all the resistance because they don't now want to read because why would you demonstrate something you can't do? So those are the troubled children in the reading world because they, need, they, they can neither read nor are they wanting to learn. They've got all the barriers there for reading. And it could be, there's all sorts of reasons that may have led to this. But certainly our focus has been, and they, they may well be getting some extra help, but our focus at one point was in this, this top left because they weren't practicing. And the evidence, which I'll talk to you later on, is so clear about those that not only learn to read but continue developing their reading are the ones who will have the advanced skills ultimately. So this is a, the, if you're interested in that, the, there's work by Stanovich which talks about the Matthew effect, which you may have come across, which is from the, the, the Christian Bible saying, essentially, the rich get richer. So if you love reading, you choose to read, you're motivated to read, you read more. It, it's a virtuous circle. You know, you read more, you get better, you get, because you're good, you read more. And it also works, you know, can't read, don't read, and the gap gets bigger. So the poor get poorer, poor readers get relatively poorer. The good readers get better because they practice more. And it's, it's, this reciprocal relationship is fundamental, and I think it applies in reading more than anything else. Um, and reading, if you think about reading in primary schools, it's the one thing where we engage parents and we say, read with your child. You know, home matters massively. And there were some children, the Matthew effect was working from age four, you know, even before then. And there's other children where the opposite applies. They don't have a book in the home. And there's nobody there who says, have you brought your book home? Can you read with me? And the gap gets bigger. So... Just, I'll just quickly go through these. Pearls uh, has the survey of, of do students like reading? So they asked a series of questions about whether they like reading or not. And I won't go through all of these because you'll get the slides. But basically, they give an answer and it divides them into three groups. Very simply, the, those who very much like reading, those who we say somewhat like reading, a bit in the middle, and those who do not like reading. Um, and as you surprise, and it also includes um, information about whether they read for fun as well, which is this, this bit about the other part of the scale. But basically, do they choose to read, reading for fun, and do they like reading? And as you'd expect, you know, do they like reading? Well, yeah, half the children in Spain, above the international average, uh, say yes, they like, very much like reading. About a third of them, you know, some of the time, probably depends on what and when. And then 10%, no. So at nine, 10% don't like reading. And you can see achievement-wise, 
as you'd expect, the 534, 534 is the highest, is the score, scale score, their reading competence. The better readers say, yes, I like, I like reading very much. In terms of country groupings, at the top of this reading enjoyment scale are um, Southern Europe, including Spain, um, Middle East and North Africa at the top of the scale. Very roughly, English speaking are around about the middle. And the Nordic countries are at the bottom of this reading enjoyment scale. So that's interesting when there's a lot of talk around how competent Finland, students in Finland are. But actually enjoyment, how they respond to the questions, and there are cultural issues with this, uh, tend to be low. Uh, th another aspect is, is their confidence in reading. Um, so reading, is one, of the, one of these questions, reading is easy for me. Um, I am just not good at reading. It's not awful, a nine-year-old just has to say, yeah, I'm just not good at reading. Um, I have no trouble reading stories with difficult words. There's a whole series of, of, of questions and they say whether they agree a lot, a, a little, disagree a little, disagree a lot with that. And again, that's produced a scale of very confident, somewhat confident and not confident uh, readers. And this was the um, data from 2016. Um, so just under a half, very confident. Uh, you can see they are the strongest readers, scale score 554. Again, another 40% somewhat confident, but about 20%, the fifth, both internationally and in Spain, are not confident in their reading. So they judge themselves to be basically other people are better than me at this, which might be the case. Um, if you look at their scale score, it looks as if they... On, a, on average, always is on average, they are the weaker, the weaker students. In contrast to the reading enjoyment, where the Nordic countries, Finland, Denmark, uh, Norway, and Sweden in pearls, were not, uh, didn't enjoy it, it reverses. They now are the confident readers. So they don't enjoy it, but they're confident. Um, English-speaking countries are in the middle again. And Southern Europe, including Spain, are at the bottom of this one. So relative to other countries, not, not as confident. Um, last one of these is on their engagement in the lessons. So are they engaged in their reading lessons? Um, so I like what I read about in school. I know what my teacher expects me to do. My teacher tells me how to do better when I make a mistake, etc. So it goes from very engaged, somewhat engaged, less than engaged. Um, and you really want the students to be interested and engaged in their reading lessons. So this is the students saying themselves whether they feel they are or not. So 70% um, come out as, as in the very engaged, which is considerably higher than the international average. Um, and only 3% not engaged. So most students in primary, I, I suspect it might be different. It's, you couldn't do quite the same question in secondary. It might be different by the time they're getting older. But most students still are in, relatively interested in and enjoying their reading lessons. Might not translate into reading voluntarily, but in school, in class, most of them quite enjoy that. And Spain, South and, Southern and Eastern Europe, Middle East, North Africa at the top, English speaking drifted around the middle, <coughs> and Nordic and Far East at the bottom again. So a lot of cultural issues as to what children will say, I think, in response to these. And finally, just the final one is why engagement matters in reading. So this goes, this, what, this um, table is from the very first Pearl, uh, PISA survey in 2000 that Juliet will recognize. It's been recast, but essentially it's the one that looks at, at now we've got to 15 year olds. It's the, well, I, I, it's the one, I can never understand why it's not 
Energy talked about in the UK, amongst other countries. But along the bottom, on the horizontal axis, you've got low reading engagement, medium reading engagement, and high reading engagement. So the sorts of things, it's slightly, it's a different type, slightly different measure, but it's the same idea as we talked about, about interest in an amount of voluntary reading, the type of reading and the, how diverse, different types of text that students read. Okay. But it's that how much and how interested they are in reading, low, medium, and high on the horizontal. And on the vertical, you've just got reading ability, reading attainment, the measure of reading. And the lines are the socioeconomic status, the background of these children, these students now, based on parental occupation. And that's the, the PISA measure, parental occupation as a proxy for socioeconomic status. And essentially what it's, what it's showing us is that, I'll get my notes because I've got different color graphs on mine. So the purple line at the bottom is students from a lower socioeconomic status. The middle, the green line is the, the middle socioeconomic status and the blue line is, is students from high socioeconomic status. And we know that disadvantage impacts on attainment. So it's not a surprise that there's a gap between the purple line, the green line, and the blue line. Because we know SES, disadvantage, impacts from early days in schooling right through. And everyone, I think all countries, aim to narrow that gap, to reduce the gap. But you can see where the gap reduces, which is on the far right, the high engagement. And those highly engaged students from low, the purple, right-hand purple diamond, the low SES, high engagement students, performed better than the high SES, low engagement students, the top blue on the left. Engagement matters. Engagement makes that difference. And it's not the cause and effect, it's an association because it's reciprocal. They get engaged, they want to read, they read more. They read more, they get better, they want to read. And this massively shows you what's happening from that early stage, preschool, and then at Pearls at nine where you see the engagement. And, you know, by and large, we know most primary children, for the most part, you can enthuse about just about anything if they get, you know, in the hands of the enthusiastic teacher. And then this shows the, what an impact it can have with high levels of engagement. So essentially, to, 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 to summarize, highly engaged students, it can comp the high engagement can compensate for the rest of that disadvantage. Yeah. Engagement really matters. And that's the end of it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very much, Liz. We'll, we'll see if there are any questions. Tenéis al algunas preguntas? en relación con la ponencia de Elise, con la evaluación a uh, Peels. Bueno, mañana, eh, en, la jornada, en, la, en la segunda jornada del curso, durante, durante la primera sesión, eh, expondremos los resultados de, de España en Peels y en Pisa. Esto ha sido una primera aproximación muy, muy exhaustiva y muy detallada, pero bueno, mañana entraremos más en la parte de resultados españoles. Y por la tarde tendrán lugar dos talleres, uno centrado en PIRS, eh, más dirigido a aquellos de vosotros que sois de primaria, otro sobre PISA, más dirigido a aquellos de vosotros que sois de secundaria, aunque, bueno, no hemos hecho mención, pero no, nos ha sorprendido gratamente la, la cantidad de especialidades y de cuerpos de, de, los, que, de los que venís y, y que representáis en este curso, niveles educativos. Entonces, bueno, mañana también profundizaremos por la tarde, como digo, en, en, en un sentido muy práctico en estas evaluaciones, 
O sea que esto, esto es un, un inicio, pero bueno, cualquier pregunta que se os plantee en este momento. Bueno, pues eh, si, si no la hay, eh, solo quedaría agradecer a las dos ponentes, Liz y Juliet, sus intervenciones, su, su tiempo, lo fácil que han hecho eh, articular y coordinar todo esto. Así que, bueno, un último aplauso para ellas. Antes de cuestiones logísticas. Thank you so much.